Let's get into this. You know, I, I guess you think this spring sale has enough to sort of spring the stock a bit from here? Well, I think every little bit helps, right? And then Amazon has been clearly uh, one of the, the primary drivers or one of the, the primary architects of shaping consumer behavior around um, uh, promotions, et cetera. But I would actually step back and just look at the progression of the quarter. January was strong, February was stronger, and March, I think, maintained the momentum that we saw in March. So the, the true SCART data indicates that the quarter should actually um, come out ahead, maybe a billion or two billion. Uh, and that's just on the marketplace. Wow. We think the AWS business is wow. uh, showing acceleration. Remember, it drops in Q2. And we think the advertising business is going to grow somewhere at twice the size or twice the rate of the broader advertising business. So we think it's going to grow somewhere between 25 and 30 percent. Digital advertising is growing in 10 to 15 percent. Yeah. Uh, wow. and advertising, obviously, a very high margin. I'm, I'm always curious, though, what what would give you pause here? Uh, you know, they can surprise us sometimes on quarters. Am I expecting the company to beat revenues and earnings per share when they report their earnings in a couple of weeks here? And the answer is absolutely. I'm expecting them to beat on revenues very nicely, probably by the minimum of a billion dollars, but probably a couple billion. And then expecting them to smash EPS as well. And then that stock's going to go over 200. When it comes to how much they choose to spend. Yeah, I, I would say that's probably it. Um, certainly the AI race is is uh, is uh, is heating up and amazon is not considered at the you know uh, the top of, of 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 that tier you obviously have alphabet you have microsoft's but amazon is a clear contender and you're going to see them continue to aggressively invest the other area uh, of big investment which they're doing very quietly but very aggressively is around building a global logistics network beyond what we already know with amazon they have this vision of being able to offer uh, delivery to uh, merchants, literally from the supplier in China all the way to people's doors. We think that they're basically taking a page out of the EWS playbook of yeah. offering logistics as a service. We think it's a hundred billion dollar business, and that's good investment. We think you know we'd lo- we'd love to send to see them invest more in that because we think that's a, again a hundred billion dollar opportunity that only amazon is positioned to to win alibaba has a big business yeah, so we started there, out talking about China. the uh, e-commerce yeah. business and the piper sandler survey that, that surveys teens twice a year came out today and shows us again that amazon just continues to dominate teen market share really impressive numbers 61 percent basically when they're asked where do they shop online amazon continues to be number one but by 60 one percent and the second is Shein at seven percent i'm wondering how important it might be for an amazon to grab a younger consumer's mind share to keep them in this flywheel early on and then throughout their sort of spending life cycle i think it's super important but remember so by our math amazon already has about 43 percent uh um, or 44 percent market share of all us e-commerce and that cuts across all age groups we think that obviously includes the younger audiences what they're doing with prime is really interesting with the Prime subscription um they have different tiers right if you're a student they'll give you a discount um a, a pretty substantial discount etc and that's to try to make sure to to, to attract this um, this younger audience, and the other is in terms of um, you know their ability to offer huge uh, uh, um, portfolio of, of of products that cater to um, you know to the to this audience. So we think it's a natural place. We don't think the Chinese e-commerce players have had any uh, dent within in, in in Amazon, which frankly we feared. Uh, coming out of uh, last year, and that all goes well for, um, for 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 the business short term. So, uh, you know, in terms of grabbing customers early on, right, and they speak about, obviously, teens using Amazon, those sorts of things. So my perspective on that is, is it important? Yes, but it's not as crazy as important as you might think. And it doesn't mean you have to stop competing for them. So let me give you a good example of when I was a teenager and where I shopped. When I was a teenager and I shopped, I went to Best Buy a lot. I went to places like uh, GameStop, places like that, right? Uh, when's the last time I bought something from Best Buy? 
probably two years ago, three years ago. When's the last time I went to GameStop? Uh, I don't even know. It was a long, long, long time ago, okay? So in regards to being a successful retailer, okay, if you have a teen shop in there, great, but you've got to continue to put on for them and continue to keep them in your ecosystem, uh, you know, into their 20s, 30s, 40s, obviously, right? So you can't just grab them and think, oh, okay, since they shop with us as a teen, like, we're good forever, okay? You've got to keep those folks in there. But there's no doubt there's a lot of folks going after the younger generation. Elf's another great example, right? They talk about Gen Alpha, you know, in, in their conference calls even. And so, yeah, they, you know, it's definitely an important thing, but it's, you gotta, you got to put on for, for decades, though. Amazon's Jassy touts AWS Kuiper opportunities, says generative AI is the next pillar. Amazon CEO Andy Jassy published his annual letter to shareholders on Thursday and touted the rebounding cloud computing. Ooh. And said, I like that, touted the rebounding cloud computing and said generative artificial intelligence is the next pillar. The 56-year-old Jassy, who took over the company for company's founder, Jeff Bezos, in 2021, said AWS ended the year on a strong note after customers were worried about costs for much of 2023. By the end of 2023, we saw op- cost optimization attenuating, which basically just means chilling, new deals accelerating, customers renewing at larger commitments over longer time periods, and migrations growing again. That's great news. Revenue attributed to AWS increased 13% year over year to $91 billion in 2023, up from $80 billion in 2022. Satellite internet opportunity, Project Kuiper, Amazon's satellite broadband, broadband internet initiative, was also highlighted in the letter as Jassy called it a very large revenue opportunity for the company. We're on track to launch our first production satellites in 2024, Jassy wrote. We still got a long way to go, but we're encouraged by our progress. The company launched two end-to-end prototype satellites in space in October. Two months later, Amazon said it had successfully completed tests of optical mesh networks of laser links between Project Kuiper internet satellites in a low Earth orbit. Project Kuiper, which competes with other satellite services such as obviously SpaceX, Starlink, is Amazon's low Earth orbit satellite initiative. It aims to provide broadband connectivity to 400 to 500 million households that don't currently have it, as well as providing better connectivity in remote areas. Big stuff, man. Big stuff. Next pillar of growth. Jassy talked up artificial intelligence in his 2023 letter to shareholders, but now believes generative AI will be the company's next pillar. While we're building on a substantial number of gen AI applications ourselves, the vast majority will ultimately be built by other companies, Jassy wrote. However, what we're building in AWS is not just a compelling app or foundation model. Amazon has three pillars or areas it describes as the most successful businesses, retail, prime, and cloud computing. He added that AWS's service will hit three layers of the stack, building foundation models, leveraging foundation models in the application layers, quote, com- comprise a set of primitive that, uh, or excuse me, primitives? 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 That's a, comp- comprise a set of Primitives that that democratize this next uh, seminal phase of AI and will empower internal and external builders to transform virtually every customer experience that we know and invent altogether new ones as well. We're optimistic that much of this world changing to AI will be built on the top of AWS. Yeah, I mean, I don't doubt it, right? I, I don't doubt it at all. I mean, much of the world is built on AWS. Obviously, the main competitor is Azure from Microsoft. And outside of that, it's kind of just a joke, right? Google's further down off that. You obviously have Oracle Cloud um, and a few others, but they're all just minuscule. It's really just AWS and Microsoft in, in the end of the day. Andy Jassy said consumers are trading down on average selling prices. In a CBC interview, Jassy said consumers are spending, but are really careful about what they spend on and how much they spend. Consumers, he said, quote, whenever they can find a deal, they take the deal. However, the everyday essentials business has had 20% growth year over year in the fourth quarter of last year. It's going to take a lot of people to not to buy detergent or shampoo or things like that. He also said that where he has seen the real impact of inflation is in discretionary items such as TVs, computers, and other electronics. 
quote, we're going, we're, we're growing our market sh segment share at faster rate than others, but still at a slower rate than what we see in a healthy economy. Interesting. Which is basically Andy Jassy's way of saying we're not in a healthy economy. <laughs> that's, that's interesting, right? It's basically just Andy Jassy saying we're not in a healthy economy. On the enterprise side, he added, during the last couple of years, companies have tried to save money. However, they could. This has been seen in Amazon Web Services. I think a lot of that cost optimization has been attenuated, he said. And we've seen a lot of deals that people were talking about um, with us for a long time, which are which were sitting on the back burner, starting to move, which is good, right? It goes from just you know people talking about it to actually you know let's put a, let's, let's sign the contract, let's actually get this done. Jesse said there's a full pipeline of e-commerce enterprises migrating from largely trying to save costs to figure out how to monetize or excuse me modernize their infrastructure again, moving from on on premises to cloud storage and thinking about how they can use generative AI to change their business. So Amazon executing well as always. Apple, Apple sentiment improving despite relatively low growth outlook from JP Morgan. Apple appears to be gaining traction among hedge funds investors despite issues with fundamentals as a tech titan appears ready to begin its entry into artificial intelligence. Oh gosh, we'll see. Quote, contrary to the deterioration of the fundamentals relative to both hardware demand as well as outlook and services growth, the interest in Apple shares have improved from the broader group of investors who have otherwise been averse to the premium valuation multiple despite one of the lowest growth outlooks relative to other mega cap techs. That's the thing. Like Apple for 2024, Apple for 2024, it's a question if they're ever going to grow their business. That's the thing. It's like, is Apple even going to grow the business in 2024? I think that's a serious question. I don't know. If they do, it's going to be maybe a few percent at the max, right? Versus a meta, which is going to have very strong growth this year. Amazon's going to have very strong growth this year. NVIDIA is going to have ridiculous growth this year, right? Google's going to have nice growth this year. Microsoft's going to have nice growth this year. So the only two of the mag seven are Apple and Tesla, right? That are seen as like, maybe they don't grow their business this year. Maybe their business is kind of flattish, right? Despite these issues, App Apple's ever popular iPhone is set to begin an AI upgrade cycle, which could lead to the same momentum Apple experienced in the 5G upgrade cycle. Part of this is due to the lack of backward compatibility, which should accelerate the replacement cycle, much like 5G capabilities. So, so they up they upgraded it to $215, right? Or to actually, wait, they lowered the price target, even though they're overweight? That's wild. So they're overweight, but yet they lowered their price target to two fifteen for uh, to two ten from two fifteen. That's crazy. But here's the deal with with Apple, right? AI, AI. I don't, I don't, I don't see that necessarily being a game changer in the, anytime soon for Apple, right? If it ever is, but certainly not short term. There's one thing that's a game changer for Apple that will be likely coming in September, and that is, guess what? It's a huge innovation from Apple. It's a bigger iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> the big innovation it will be here in September. It's a bigger iPhone. And if what I've been hearing is accurate, and they do come out with that bigger iPhone in September, it's going to bode great for Apple sales of iPhones next year. Okay? So that's a big innovation. Is AI going to – I don't think Apple's going to do anything. AI is going to make everybody say, I got to go get this new iPhone. No. But, but, but. A bigger iPhone, and people will say, oh my gosh, I gotta get the, it's even bigger than the previous one, I gotta go get it. Apple, every time they come out with a bigger iPhone, it's usually always a big bull cycle for a year or two, and, and that's what you'll see play out likely in this situation as well, okay? All right, let's get into this next one. Hot CPI print rattle stocks. From the Chicago Fed President, Austin Goolsby, you're also gonna hear from Richmond mm. Fed President, Tom Barkin, that's 1245. So we have a little time to wait, but the good news is we can bring in our own Steve Leisman, our senior economics reporter to game this whole thing out about what if anything changed today and i think if anything i don't know it validates everything that all of these fed speakers have been saying day after day after day no rush we can afford to wait maybe we'll do it later in the year what, what how would you assess what today does to how they think today 
I think that's right. I do think, though, I, I believe it was Steve Weiss talking about this, that you, you do have additional risk now, Scott, uh, risk from, from two standpoints. One is that they don't cut at all, and the other is that maybe they have to reverse course. I don't think that's the uh, next likely thing that the Federal Reserve does. I think it believes, and it's a, this is an important uh, point, I think, the Fed believes it's restrictive. If you look at where they are now, where they believe they're projected to go this year, and I think I have a bar chart on this, and what they think the neutral rate is at 2.6%, that's the median, they think they're restrictive. They think the rates currently are in a place where actually maybe even a bit too high. There are the three numbers that I think are the key. So relative to the left side of your chart, where they're at, and relative to what they believe the long run rate is, there's, you know, call it three, two and a half percentage points in there, which means that even if inflation runs a percentage point hotter than they expect, there's still room for them to believe they're restrictive. This is the underlying belief about why the Fed believes rates can come down. Right. The trouble is the optics of this, Scott, and the credibility issue, which is that I do not believe the Federal Reserve will be cutting interest rates while the actual inflation numbers are stalled and not improving. They, they also have to be incredibly mindful, Steve, of what... My I mean, if you want to know when does the Fed start cutting, okay, I'll tell you the exact numbers the Fed starts cutting rates. It's If you get three months in a row in the twos, I think the Fed will start cutting. But we're in the threes. And we're at 3.5 now. We're actually going up. We, we bottomed at around, what was it, 3.1 recently. And now we're up to 3.5. So we're going the wrong way in this. I think if you've got three consecutive months in the twos, it doesn't have to be exactly 2.0. It could be like 2.9, 2.8, 2.6. Fed starts cutting right after that. But you've got to get there. And the problem is, are we getting there this year? I'm saying it's looking more and more likely we're not. With CPI coming in at 3.5 right now, and we got commodities going on a run, which is really going to negatively affect things in the back half of the year unless commodities start to sink in the next few months. If commodities crash in the next few months, I don't say crash, if they just stop going up over this next three months, then I think CPI is not as big of an issue for the back half of the year. But if gas prices start running, oil prices, nat gas, and uh, all the other commodities in general, if those run into the back half of the year, it's not going to be good for, for these inflation numbers. And the likelihood that we'd come in in the twos is not very likely, especially when you got rents going up, housing starting to go up, and you obviously have auto insurance and just insurance in general being an issue. Happen if they wait too long to cut, either a mistake or ruining this great story that they seem to have been able to write. The book isn't finished yet. Maybe the market and some market participants have gotten ahead of themselves trying to write the ending too early. But nonetheless, they don't want to mess the story up. I think that's right. But, but I do think there's an interesting conflict here between the theory and the practice. Um, I think it was uh, maybe Joe who was just saying the earnings are coming in. The economy is strong. None of this should be happening. All of this violates the theory of what happens when you raise interest rates at the speed of light to 5.38% and you don't get essentially a pop in the unemployment rate to speak of, you don't get a slowing of the economy, and you keep going ahead further. So the, the Fed needs to be mindful here that the theory of it being restrictive is not necessarily um, taking place in the reality of the economy. And that's what might put them on pause. I think one of the good and the bad things about Powell not being an economist, I'll tell you the good part, is he's not married to the dogma of the theory. Uh, uh, and, and I think that that means that he will reverse course if he needs to. If he sees the economy not, you know, the way it's behaving, he'll react to that much more than he will uh, hunker down into the theory of the fact that they're restrictive and it That's should fair. be happening. I think what we're learning too, you know, Steve, is that this once in a hundred year event of the pandemic has made it virtually impossible for economists, policymakers, or anybody yeah. else to have a full understanding about <laughs> what it means to go into that kind of event and then come out when you pile stimulus upon stimulus on top of it. And then when you introduce the level of rate cuts and the speed in which they did it, to your point, you would assume things would happen when maybe they wouldn't. We're trying to get our arms around this still. 
Yeah, we're all learning as we go here. And I think that requires a bit of humility on all parts, on the part of the bulls, on the part of the bears. Um, we have not had the disaster that a lot of people predicted the recession didn't happen. You're right, Scott. There are abiding concerns. Uh, at some point, we're going to turn around and say, you know, Mr. Chairman, you may be too restrictive here. Look at this happening in the economy. We don't really have this thing yet, which is really an important point, Scott. And I think we've had That's this fair. discussion. That's fair. If, if I get, a, get called on for a question to the chair, I would be really happy to say, Mr. Chair, how could you be missing this unbelievably bad thing happening in the economy with your rates so high? I don't see what that is, which, by the way, I think it underpins the investment thesis on equities here, which is the investment thesis on earnings and the outlook there. Mm -hmm. But I also think, you know, it does introduce some risks you have to be mindful of. We were talking about the idea that the uh, March inflation numbers were not going to be what you expected. But there is, of course, an echo of last year where we had those high rates at the beginning and then it came down during the year. So if you're looking for a bullish case here, something to hang a hat on, you might say, well, there's some residual seasonality out there that will work itself out during the year and will be helpful down the road and they'll get those numbers just not as not as quickly as you expected sure you know, the problem is you're hoping for that down the road but the issue is you could also have commodities keep running into the back half of the year and then that just cancels out and is a net net nothing in the end and inflation is still on the threes right um I appreciate it very much, Steve. Thank you. Our senior economics reporter, Steve Leesman, he's at the Fed, of course, in D.C. because we get the minutes a little bit later, and that's an interesting and important event, too. Bryn, to Steve's point on the investment thesis intact, because the expectation is that earnings are going to be pretty good, right? Expectations have come in, hair? but HSBC today says they're still too low, that expectations are just too low. Wow. Do we start getting these reports coming in and say, okay, that's, wh that's why we thought that the thesis was intact? Yeah, I think it's going to come down to security and sector. And just to kind of build on what Joe said earlier, I think that it's easier to know what you don't want to own to say that's not intact. So it's like you don't want to own long duration bonds. You don't want to own small cap value. You don't want to own small cap growth. It's like stick to, I think, high quality tech, which could be the Qs, individual names, energy, industrials, which I know Jim likes. And so I think you really have to pick your spots because I do think there's going to be a big separation between the wheat and the chaff, mm -hmm. especially in this in this earnings season, because the analysts are reducing estimates here. They're not increasing estimates. No, we were up for like 10 to 5 percent in terms of earnings growth. But that's a 10 to 5. That's a huge deal. I understand. Deal. Yeah. But when you've been at negative <laughs> right. earnings growth right. for quarter after quarter right. after quarter for a while, you'll take the 5. We'll take the 5. And, and, and we all know the analysts always over oh, go too high and we come down. But I do think it comes down to these individual numbers. And I I think that this market this quarter, especially when small and mid cap growth will not suffer fools. I think you're going to see if you even slightly miss, you're going to have like a 10 to 15 percent yeah. down date, like we saw last quarter, by the way, and many other quarters. But I think this will be especially painful with the yield backdrop. So uh, on that note, I do want to get into what areas of the market may be most vulnerable. But you gave us a list of your sort of must own areas yes. after the CPI was released in light of what the market's doing with the Dow down more than 500 and yields obviously mm -hmm. up. Must owns, according to Joe Terranova, commodities, not just the refiners, metals and materials, mm -hmm. insurance companies and private equity. Yep. Why, so, why'd you put your list of those three? Okay, so far, so far month to date, the S&P is down 2%. Are we on the cusp of a deeper decline? No one knows the answer to that. But even if we are, it is imperative that you own commodities in this environment. You mentioned energy, you mentioned metals. I would add upon that steel, steel dynamics is a name that's contained in the Joe T ETF, Vulcan materials, Martin Marietta, extending beyond that. Steve, I know you've done a nice job with uh, Archer Daniels Midland. You could throw Bungie into that. You could throw tech resources. Secondarily, who has pricing power right now? Insurance companies have pricing power. Progressive, we own Arch Capital in the ETF. And then lastly, if rates remain elevated, Private equity continues to be the liquidity solution because lending standards for public credit will be tight and restrictive in that nature. That takes you to Apollo Management, KKR, Brown and Brown. Those are three areas of the market right now. Even in the decline, you could go in and own. What do we think of this, Weiss? You know, I don't disagree with any of that. I mean, I was having a conversation yesterday uh, with somebody who's been in, in the private market investing in insurance and in auto insurance. Mm -hmm. Numbers through the roof. The profitability is unbelievable. We looked at one company last year, which unfortunately we well, didn't last. do. 
that was an auto insurer, right so prime, and their cash flow estimates were exceeded by 50%. Yeah. I mean, those are real numbers. Look, for me, what I'm astounded by today, frankly, is that cat is flat, that deer cat is, is flat. flat. Those would be the first ones that you would think would take gas with this kind of, with rates moving up. But in the pre-market, they did. So if you sold it then, you lost. But right now, it's unbelievable, as well as you see with Meta. So to me, this is, I don't know if it's cautionary that people aren't paying the proper amount of attention. I could see those stocks of Meta being flat. Maybe because they don't think that the story's changed. Right, and I I think that, again, it goes back to your fundamentals. If you're basing your buying and your portfolio positioning on rates coming down, Mm -hmm. then I think you're making a mistake. So let's just have... If I ask you the question, is the next move from the Fed a cut or a hike? How would you answer that question? Uh, uh, next move from Fed is no move. No, no, no. Don't, uh, don't give me that nonsense. That's not nonsense. It's factual. The next the move that they be, make. That's not a move. Not do anything. Are they going to cut next or hike? They're probably going to cut. Okay, thank yeah. you. <laughs> that was actually a good question. Folks, these companies, man, woo. They're gouging. They're gouging out there. That's all I got to say. But the one person who isn't, who's actually throwing deals, trying to keep deflation going on out there, which we don't have any dang deflation, is me, folks. Pin comment down there at a one-day sale, usually $125, bucks, doing it for $69 for one day only. Access my number one course ever, teach you everything you need to know about picking stocks and whatnot, as well as see the moves I'm making in that portfolio each week and you also get access to that Discord chat, folks, okay? Yeah, everybody else going up on price. I said, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm doing a big deal, okay? Pin comment down there. Much love and have a great day.